Good morning. I'm Reverend Lori Bruce, and the worship team and I want to welcome you to worship this morning on the second Sunday after Easter here at Rockport United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're joining us this morning, and I'd like to invite you to sing along with the hymns and to say out loud the parts in the bulletin that are in bold print. Let us now join in the call to worship. Life has been revealed to us in this Easter season. Gather once more to testify to life. We declare to each other what we have experienced. In community, we find the life God intends. Early believers were one of one heart and soul. We too are called to find common ground in Christ. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Peace be with you as we celebrate resurrection. Christ is with us to renew our faith. We are here to testify to God's grace. We will share our story and ourselves. You pour out upon us the oil of gladness, gracious God, as we gather in the name of our risen Savior. You have given us the word of life. We have heard and seen your greatest gift of all gifts and testify to that experience by our presence here. Let Jesus Christ be known among us in our conversations and in our prayers. May our thoughts center on the message that light has come to chase away the shadows Community has been born to remove our isolation. Joy has been heaped upon us that we might share it with the world. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news. Jesus Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. 
Amen. Hello to you guys. I cannot believe it's an entire week after Easter already. Okay, I pretty much mostly ask you a question or two or four when we begin together every week. We're going to backtrack a little, way, way, way back to a story that happened when Jesus encountered some fishermen. How many of you have ever gone fishing? What did you use as bait? Did you use worms or man-made lures? Did you catch any fish? For those of you who have not been fishing yet, picture yourself with a fishing pole and some bait on it, sitting in a boat or on the edge of the water, maybe on a pier. Fishing can be fun, but it can be also kind of disgusting. Not gonna lie. You have to grab the worm and squish it on the hook, and believe it or not, when I was a pretty young kid, I did that myself. I know you would probably want me to prove that because I don't think anybody believes me. But I didn't really like that part, but I wanted to fish at my uncle's farm and so I did it. After the bait part, you stick your pole in the water and you hope that you catch a fish. Then if you do catch a fish, you have to cut it open and take the guts out and that is really gross, ew. I didn't actually do that part ever either. I gave that part to the grown-ups. Or I threw them back in the water. Really, I threw them back way more than I gave them to the grown-ups. The story I have to tell you today is about some men who were fishermen. They didn't just fish for fun. Fishing was their job. If I had to survive by having a job where fishing was what I had to do for actual fish, I would never get the bills paid. Fishermen have to fish just about every day, and they were probably good at it. They didn't use bait to catch their fish. They used a net and would scoop up lots of fish at one time, usually onto a boat. One night, though, they were not having much luck. All night long, they sailed their boats from one side of the lake to the other side of the lake to catch some fish. They threw their nets in the water and they put them back many times, but they just didn't seem to be any fish around. They fished all night and they, all they got were some dirty nets. As they were cleaning their nets the next morning, Jesus came up to Simon Peter, who was one of the fishermen, and told him to take his boat back out onto the lake and throw out his net again. Simon, and, Simon Peter and his friends were very tired and they were hungry, but they did what Jesus asked them to do. And they went back out onto the lake again and threw out their nets just where Jesus told them to throw. And when they pulled up their nets this time, they were so heavy with fish that the nets started to rip. Simon Peter called to his friends in the other boat to come and help him. Soon they caught so many fish that their boats were beginning to sink. The fishermen were amazed. How did Jesus know where the fish were? They had looked all night long and could not find even one. They thought there had to be something very special about this man, Jesus. They were really excited to meet him. Then Jesus did something else really amazing. He told the fishermen that if they followed him, he would make them fishers of men. This sounded really exciting to the fishermen. They knew how to catch fish, but men? How could they not follow a man who seemed to know everything? The fishermen left their boats and everything they had and followed Jesus. They became Jesus' disciples and they learned from him how to become fishers of men. When we follow Jesus, we also learn how to be fishers of men. What does that even mean, to be a fisher of men? Instead of catching, catching fish, we gather people. We tell people about Jesus so they also want to follow him too. My next question to you guys today, because you knew I'd have more than one, when you hear the word disciple, what do you think about? Think right now about this, disciple. What words or phrases or definitions come to mind right now when you hear that word, disciple? The word disciple means to learn. Here's a list that I came up with when I hear that word. People who follow Jesus. 12 people way back in Jesus' time. Devoted followers. Believers. Faithful. These are the people who helped Jesus, learn from him, were with him at the Last Supper, and when he was arrested. If you guys remember some of the stuff I talked about during Lent, Holy Week, and on Easter, 
There were disciples who had different roles in the days leading up to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples go with Jesus to the garden while he prays, but they fall asleep even though he asks them to stay awake. When he is led away after being arrested, they run away. Jesus' closest friends end up really screwing up. Am I right? But these were the people that Jesus chose to be his disciples and to carry on his ministry, spreading the good news to all. The news that we are all forgiven and we will be able to be eternally with God. They were far from perfect. Jesus could have chosen nearly perfect or brilliant people or all rich people or all people who were perfectly dressed, but his disciples had flaws and they were not perfect. What would a modern day disciple of Jesus look like? How would they act? How would they live? How would they interact with others? In today's world, would we recognize a disciple? I think what a disciple looks like is someone who loves Jesus, puts him first in our center, someone who will be dedicated to following Jesus the way he taught everybody to live their lives, and someone who tries not to be influenced by the outside world when the outside world is not behaving in a way that God would approve of. Someone who will always choose to be kind, someone who would try not to only spread the good news about Jesus' sacrifice for us, but all of his teachings. Someone who tries to love as Jesus loved, loving the poor, the sad, the sick, the happy, everyone, even people we don't even really like. I say to you today, all of you, the children and youth in our Rockport family, I know you guys. And I know that you are all disciples of Jesus. Not perfect, but people who love God and try to always be kind and do their best. In the United Methodist Church, we talk about going out and making disciples of Jesus Christ. And we talk about helping people deepen their relationship with God by showing our actions and deeds and our love. My challenge for you guys this week is to show you are a disciple of Jesus by your actions. Think about everything you're doing while you're doing it this coming week. Whether you're talking to your parents, calling a friend, interacting with people at school, observing something happening that you can help with, seeing someone who is lonely, even just smiling at someone can be a kindness. Now it's hard to smile when you're outside your bubble and you have to wear your mask, right? but you can still do it and you can remember it for later. We're not always gonna be wearing masks someday in the future. We will not be wearing them all the time and people will see you smile again. This may be exhausting. Thinking about your every move as you're doing it all week long, but really try it out. I'm really interested in your findings for this challenge. Also, don't forget you are supposed to be putting things in your blessing jars every single week as well, which is our year-long challenge. All right, you guys, let's have our prayer. Loving Father, open our hearts to new experiences. Open our hearts to your love for all people. Open our hearts to your presence in our community. Open our hearts to your call to justice and peace. Help us to imitate the example you gave to us by healing the sick, welcoming the stranger, and assisting the poor and helpless. In your loving name, we pray these things. Amen.
gospel lesson comes from John 20, 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to him, them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus began his earthly ministry preaching, teaching, healing, and forgiving sins. And now at the end of his earthly ministry, in his post-resurrection appearance to his disciples, Jesus is passing on to his disciples the ministry of preaching, teaching, healing, and forgiving sins. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, they are to be empowered to continue the work he began. Jesus has given us the power to forgive others. In the Gospels, we often overlook the connection between forgiveness and healing, healing that is both physical and spiritual. Consider, for example, the story of Jesus healing the paralytic who was lowered through a roof to the feet of Jesus. I have long enjoyed this story of Jesus' healing of the paralytic. It has drama to it, a deep sense of faith, friendship, and a touch of humor. Think of it, imagine uh, just for a minute, a crowded house with people hanging out the windows and the doors. They are so excited to see Jesus. And then there's this beautiful picture of the four men carrying their paralytic friend on a stretcher, attempting to get close to Jesus for healing. But the only way they could possibly get through that crowd was to go over them. So they went up the outside stairs to the roof, tore the roof apart, and lowered the paralytic right in front of Jesus. Talk about determination and persistence, but also talk about gall. Just who were they to think that they could tear someone's house apart? Can you see the debris and the dust tumbling down? And then the paralytic being lowered, perhaps a little embarrassed? And can you think, <clears throat> uh, and can you see the owner of the house thinking, oh my gosh, there goes the roof. I wonder how much it'll cost to repair. Nevertheless, it is a charming and powerful story. <clears throat> It is a story of the faith and determination of four friends to try, to, get, to try their best to get their friend to Jesus for healing. Where do you find friends like that today who care enough to put themselves out and to suffer embarrassment and inconvenience for the sake of someone else? Think for a minute about your friends and yourself. Would you do the same for them as these four friends did in the scripture? Would they do the same for you? It is also a story which goes to the central problem of human existence, the problem of forgiveness. Is forgiveness possible? Are healing and forgiveness interrelated? Is religion more a hindrance than a help when it comes to forgiveness? And who is it really that has the power to forgive sins? It is well known that in Jesus' time, disease was often thought to be the result of sin. Following much the same theology as expressed in the book of Job, disease and misfortune were regarded as God, God's punishment for some wrong. On another occasion, when Jesus healed the man born blind, the question was asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? It was assumed that the blindness was a punishment for sin. Addressing the popular thinking, Jesus said to the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. The theologians who had been sent from Jerusalem on a fact-finding team accused him of blasphemy, claiming only God had the power to forgive sins. More than that, God forgave people only after they had done enough acts of penance to deserve forgiveness. Who did Jesus think he was anyway? Was he presuming to be God? Jesus replied, well, would it be easier to say you are cured, take up your bed and walk? 
which is precisely what the paralytic did. The one who had been carried on the stretcher now was bearing it. The Son of Man does have power to forgive sins, and the cure is the proof of it, Jesus said. Forgiveness is real. Forgiveness is possible, not only for God, but for Christ, and for the sons and daughters of Christ, you and me. Because we have received the Holy Spirit, we are all people with the power to forgive. All of us have the power to affect healing in our community. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, said Jesus. When once asked how many times should we forgive, Jesus said 70 times seven, which I got at my calculator, is 490 times. That's quite a lot. People with the power to forgive recognize that forgiveness is a gift, not an achievement. Much of us think we must somehow earn forgiveness or deserve it. The fact is, forgiveness is a free gift from God, a gift of grace that we don't have to earn. Many of us are self-sufficient types and have uh, difficulty accepting a gift. I've always been an independent person and helping others is, is really easy, but accepting help from others is hard. Um, so when my husband Bill passed away, um, a lot of people said, what can we do to help? And you know, I couldn't think of anything. And then a cousin asked me and I said, well, um, I'm having a hard time keeping the house clean. And he said, well, I'll pay for six months of house cleaners. And that was such a gift. And um, it felt strange um, that someone was helping me. And then I thought about it. Well, I am, I, it makes me feel good to help others. So I need to let others help me and it makes them feel good too. It's reciprocal. Uh, and it taught me a huge lesson. I am not the only one to help others. We are here on this earth to help one another, and that includes giving and receiving forgiveness. The forgiven person experiences God not so much as a judge, but as a dear family member. But religion wants to make God the lawyer who demands perfect obedience before he will love and forgive. Not so, said Jesus. God is ready to forgive those ready to accept his forgiveness as a gift. That is why the paralytic was healed and why the theological fact-finding team from Jerusalem was so angry. They wanted to make God's love and forgiveness conditional. They wanted it to be a reward for law-keeping and achievement. To offer forgiveness to anyone who was humble enough to accept it was an affront to their pride and legalism. If then we are to experience self-acceptance, if we are to experience liberation and healing, if we are to know true grace and renewal, we shall have to have the humility to accept forgiveness as a gift of God. However, people with power to forgive will need to give and receive forgiveness from each other. A minister once said, once when talking with a wedding couple, I said some of the most important words for a healthy marriage are, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. One bride responded she could readily say, I'm sorry, and please forgive me, but she found it almost impossible to say, I was wrong. Most of us have the same problem. We have immense difficulty admitting we were wrong. Oh, to be sure, we readily see where others are wrong. We are quick to point out the faults of the other person. We are glad to excuse and rationalize our own faults, but we are usually not so charitable with the other person. When we are honest, we know the truth of Jesus saying that we should remove the wooden beam for our own eye before we try to remove the speck of sawdust from the, our brother or sister's eye. Did you know the word forgive literally means to give back again, to start over again, and to start over anew and afresh? Yet in our grudge bearing, this is precisely what we fail to do. A grudge is a claim on another person's life. That person has done us wrong, either a real or perceived wrong, and we will not let them forget it. We do not let them forget it because the grudge gives us power over them. But there's an ironic twist to grudge bearing. Bearing the grudge becomes a life draining burden. While we are waiting to get even, to right the wrong, the world is out dancing. Grudge bearing is something like carrying around radioactive nuclear waste, 
ready to hurl it at our enemy, only to find that radioactivity is destroying us. Well, I have a story to tell. <laughs> In 1997, I was serving as pastor of Green River United Methodist Church in Green River, Wyoming, and I was working on a sermon uh, on forgiveness and thought about my life and, you know, that saying, practice what you preach, and I realized that I had been holding a grudge for a long time. In seminary, I dated a fellow student named Skip, and for two years, um, we had dated, and the Christmas of our senior year, we were talking about marriage. Then, um, two months later, on Valentine's Day, he brought me flowers and said he was breaking up with me and had met someone else. Well, I was hurt and devastated, and every year after we graduated, I saw him three times a year at conference events. And I acted cold and unfriendly, which is really not who I am. Um, it took lots of energy to be cold and unfriendly. And three years after graduation from seminary, I married my soulmate, Bill Bruce, and was very happily married. And as I was writing my sermon at Green River, I realized that I needed to stop holding that grudge against Skip. And I prayed all week about it, and I realized I had the power to decide to let it go and forgive Skip, which I did. And it was ironic, I saw him two weeks later at a church retreat and told him, told him that I had finally forgiven him and he said he was glad. And I was glad too. Why should we forgive others? Forgiveness is a decision and only hurts us to hold a grudge. Is forgiveness real? Is it possible? Yes, says Jesus to the legalistic, fact-finding theologians from Jerusalem. Forgiveness is real and possible because God is love and always has been. God is not a legalist. God is a lover, says Jesus, and he created people to be lovers, to be forgivers, to practice and to experience the, the power of forgiveness. Not only does God have power to forgive, so does Jesus and the sons and daughters of Jesus. In fact, Jesus, Jesus even goes so far to say that if we expect forgiveness from God, we ought to forgive one another. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We pray that each week, and uh, we're going to say that pretty soon. We have the power within us to give up the grudge, to lay aside the tired old claims to forgive and forget the wrongs done to us, especially if we are honest enough to see the wrongs we have done to others. In the movie The Mission, one of the leading characters is converted from being a slave trader of Brazilian Indians to be a Jesuit priest. But he insists on doing penance, dragging a heavy bundle through the jungle back to the Indians he used to enslave. Once back in a dramatic cliffside scene, where the bundle threatened to make him fall, the Indians cut away the bundle. The people he had formerly enslaved forgave him and set him free. We have the power to do that for each other. As Martin Luther pointed out centuries ago, we are a priesthood of believers who are to be priests for one another, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. We do have the power to forgive as God's sons and daughters. Or as Jesus said even centuries earlier, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. We have received the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore be people who exercise our power to forgive. And I'll leave you with one question as I close. Who do you need to forgive today? Amen. Will you join me now in the affirmation of faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray together. Ever-present God, who by the power of the Holy Spirit transforms us individually and as a church to be your dwelling place, confront us here in this midst of our doubts, grant us your peace while we face our fears, and increase our trust that we truly embrace life in all its fullness. Speak to us now the word we need, empowering us to be a unifying presence in our broken world. Amen. Um, it's time for silent prayer in a moment, and during that silent prayer, um, I invite you to thank God for all the joys in your life and to pray for those, including yourself, that need prayer. Let us now take a time of silent prayer. And now let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now I invite you to continue to send in your tithes, gifts, and offerings to the church office. And on the website, there's also a way you can give, and we appreciate your generosity.
Now let us join together in the prayer of dedication. We give, thanks, we give you thanks and praise, O God, for the free and abundant gift of grace you have given us in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gifts of our lives be a sign of our unending gratitude for your undying love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Now let us go out into the world as forgiving and forgiven people, knowing that God, the Redeemer, Creator, and Sustainer is with us always. Amen.